Hello, and welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding on your journey to optimal healing. Hey guys, if you have not heard, uh, our movie Doctor Patient is now available online streaming for rent, for gift, for purchase. You can go to doctorpatientmovie.com and check that out. And if you haven't yet seen it, uh, please do take a look and let me know what you think. Today, I have the honor of interviewing my guest, Dr. David Rosensweet. He's the founder of the Institute of Bioidentical Medicine and the Menopause Method, as well as the author of three books on the subject, including his latest, Happy, healthy hormones. Now, I know with my audience, there is a lot of women who've experienced these symptoms. So stay tuned because we're going to dive in to give you some really great tools and resources in your journey. And whether it's you, your daughter, your mother, your sister, or if you're a man, we often have a lot of men listening, your wife or your loved one, or again, another person in your life that needs this information. I hope you will listen and pass it on. Um, Dr. Rosensweet has over 30 years of experience specializing in andropause and menopause treatment. He's an internationally known lecturer and presenter. Early in his career, he trained the first nurse practitioners in the United States and was in charge of health promotion for the state of New Mexico. Currently, he spends a majority of his time as a medical director of the Institute of Bioidentical Medicine, where he trains medical practitioners to specialize in menopause and andropause. Welcome, Dr. Rosensweet. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so good to be with you, Jill. Yeah, so we were just talking uh, cows and farms and menopause and movies <laughs> right before we got on here. And um, I want to start for you with your story. I always love to hear how did you get into medicine and then how did the trajectory go from medical practitioner to um, bioidentical hormones and menopause and andropause? Well, I love that question. Uh, I think... Little did I know when I was young that it was my dharma. It was in my bones. It was in my heart. And by 12, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. So my high school civics paper was on me being wanting to be a surgeon. Um, and I just knew it. And, uh, found, you know, I also had some experiences along the way. And you were telling me about your, your new movie that I think is such a crucial piece that uh, one day I remember I was so ill. I, I had a flu of some kind and I was like 11 and I just felt as awful as an 11 year old can possibly feel. And my mom took the liberty of take, uh, calling up my uncle Leonard, who was a general practitioner. And uh, I, I sat, I, I met him in his office. He was on a Saturday and um, I was sitting in a chair, just slumped over feeling awful, feeling like, is this the end of the world? <laughs> And my uncle Leonard was about six four and a very large human being, larger than life. Walked into the room with his big smile and his white coat on, and he said, "Oh, so good to see you. Oh, you're going to be fine." And I transformed internally. Wow! What he said to me and who he was and his energy, I felt immediately much better. I knew I was going to heal. And you know, you've elaborated on this so much that I'm not going to take up our time here. And then I went to medical school, loved it. The University of Michigan, it was like going to a synagogue or a church for me. And uh, then I, immediately in 1968, in my, when I was a senior, I started getting interested in what other tools are out there. And I started learning about what the GPs out in the, in the outback used to do, B12 and armor thyroid. And <clears throat> it began my journey into functional medicine before it had a name back then. And then in 1992, when I was practicing in Santa Fe, Deborah walks into my office before office hours. I'm sitting at my desk doing paperwork. She's in her mid-40s. I knew her to be brilliant and a happy person. And she had retired in her mid-40s. Think about that one. Wow. <laughs> what it took to do that. And she walks right up to my desk, pounds her fist on my desk and says, listen, don't think you know me. I'm going crazy. And I mean it. And don't tell me, don't tell me some minor thing. And serendipitously, so to speak, although I think there's divine guidance always involved, I had been speaking to John Lee yes. in 1992, and he was extolling the virtues of progesterone and mood, for example. And I gave her some topical progesterone, 
And three weeks later, I get a letter from her saying, I can't believe this stuff. I'm totally myself again. And that was dramatic because how often in medicine, the, by the time someone's made an appointment with us, it's often a slow moving train to help them restore their health. And here, this dramatic thing had happened overnight, but I, I wasn't thinking. Um, she started referring her friends to me. And before I knew it, I had a practice uh, with hat, that was half menopause. And it suited me beautifully. I love biochemistry. I love hormone the roadmaps. And off I went. And then functional medicine knowledge base was growing so much, I couldn't keep my arms around it. There was Dr. Bredesen's work and Dr. Houston's work. And I, I didn't feel like it was an integrity to treat people who had severe cognitive decline or hypertension. So long story short, I decided to specialize 30 years ago. And uh, the story just really blossomed from then. That was a big decision for me. And then halfway along the line and working with compounding pharmacists, I opened up a jar of bias, seeing it for the first time. And it had a strong odor coming out of the jar. I was fascinated. I had never seen a hormone, but there was a misshipment to my office. And I went, what's this? This is, what's, what is this? And I learned that the topicals were in these strong solvents because they needed to be because they're poorly soluble. And so we went on to develop an organic oils base for the topicals. And, you know, it just got better and better and more interesting and more interesting. I feel very blessed. Uh, we have a big team. We have a big mission. We'd like to help women and men, millions and millions and millions, experience the, the, the powerful benefit of uh, bioidentical hormones and good, good, good menopause and andropause medicine, because there's a lot of moving parts in there. So that's part of the story. I love that so much. There's so many pearls in your story. First of all, the first experience as a teenager or young person in your uncle's office and what he showed you was number one, just like he, I often say to the patients, you can borrow my faith in the process, like my belief that you will get well. And what he did is loaned you his faith that you were going to be fine. And at that moment, that bestowing upon you of his belief in you was just enough medicine to transform you right and you and I were talking before like that is so powerful for us to come not that we have all the answers I am very humble with my limitations but I also know that the divine gives me wisdom that I don't deserve sometimes and so <laughs> as I as I embrace that and then share that with a patient like no I know you're going to be okay it, it really is powerful medicine so I love that it started there and then I love all the trajectory, the serendipity of the of those experiences. And you clearly are one of the forefront leaders with as long as you've been doing this in functional integrative and hormone, bioidentical hormones. So I love that. And then having personally just gone through menopause myself, I knew this stuff well. And I was kind of like you in residency when I was the only one who was doing hormones. I had tons of the community. You know how resident clinics are normally like maybe indigenous or like the different populations are served. Well, all of a sudden I had the wealthy housewives of the suburbia coming to me because I was the only one doing hormones back in the day. And just like you, I right from the beginning loved the complexity of the biochemistry and physiology that we go into medicine to learn. And then sometimes we forget by the wayside. So I love that story on so many levels. So you have really made it a practice. Now you're just teaching and training clinicians, which I love. Um, what do you see as right now? I think there's a landscape where more and more women are realizing hormones are critical and there's a shift in the tide. Um, and I even know some of my conventional trained, maybe ob colleagues and stuff are starting to say, you know, Jill, what do you know about this? Where do you see the tide turning and where do you see things headed in this realm? Because women really deserve to know about their hormones and optimal health even after menopause? Well, I think there's several aspects to the turning of the tide. Um, no branch of medicine I ever witnessed gets so stunted by uh, uh, something as impactful as the Women's Health Initiative study. So while so many of our other aspects of medicine were differentiating into specialties, the Women's Health Initiative scared the public and the providers and there were 18 million women in 2002 on Premen or Prempro. There was 40% of the American women in menopause. And then it went down to about 2 million overnight because of the frightening and false information mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was just blasted out into the world. 
And so while other specialties were developing, there is no specialty in treating women and men, and it scared the patients away. And I think one of the, the, the monumental moments of change that are occurring is finally, trickle by trickle, molecule by molecule, the true information about risk yes. for women and for men is filtering its way into, first of all, the inquisitive American women, Yes. And led by hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not a few million American women who, who you know, tend to wake up uh, earlier than others <laughs> and get health concerned and concerned about life. And they're sourcing it on their own. Yes. And then there's, a, there's also, so if, if it's useful to your audience, I'd like to review the risk information. That's exactly where I'd like to go because they need they deserve to know the facts and especially their doctor hasn't really updated their knowledge base. They might be getting told about risks that aren't true and valid. So yes, let's outline that. That's great. So for one thing, in the you, you know your audience can download a free PDF version of the book, and in chapter three I cover risk, and then there's a Bible about risk that I'll refer to everyone to in a moment for those who really want to dive deep into the science. But here is the science. All of us, every human being is at risk for thousands of diagnoses. A lot of them are rough ones. And we're also at risk for hundreds of cancers. And as a male, for example, I have an increased relative risk for getting prostate cancer. And that's new and that's recent. And that increased relative risk is there for reasons. And women have an increased relative risk for developing breast cancer. And that's changed. Uh, that's changed dramatically over the decades that I've been in practice. And yet, given that we're all at risk, the science is this. Women who are treated with hormones are at less risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke than women who go untreated. Yes. Women who are treated with hormones, and that's a broad class there, are at less risk. Than women, who, uh, than women who are untreated. And to take it a little further, just to put, uh, put an explanation point on it, women who have had breast cancer and had that breast cancer properly treated happen to be at an increased relative risk for recurrence than a woman who's never had breast cancer. Given that she is at increased risk, that risk is lessened if a woman is treated with hormones than if she's not. That's the science. That's the science. And if you want to read the Bible about it, there's a book called Estrogen Matters. Yes. It's written by an oncologist, Auburn Blooming and Carol Tavris. And it's got 450 references for those who really love to dive deep into the science. But that's the science. One of my favorite books is actually on my bedside. And I just want to speak from a woman who was diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer at 25 years old. So a little over 20 years ago, I personally have a very big vested interest in the truth because I, my life is at risk if I weren't to know the truth. And I will publicly say I am on hormone replacement therapy for menopause. There is zero question in my mind about the positive benefits of that for my brain, for my bones, for my heart, and for my breast. So I just want to second that and publicly say that I'm a living example of having gone through this and really understanding the risk and taking that into account with my choices. Yes, and I knew this was uh, knew this information decades ago, even when the Women's Health Initiative came out, and I've treated many, and I'm, I'm currently treating women who's had breast cancer. It's a it's a great thing. Yeah. So uh, to those women who, you know, there's still misinformation. And so I'd love for you to kind of address because I think it's probably because right around the time I came out of medical school was 2001. So that was right a year before this WHI study came out. And even me, who was very open-minded, functionally trained and in integrative medicine right out of the chute in residency, I uh, succumbed to the false belief that there was a big risk there, just like the media told us. And I know you can speak to this, but if I recall, it actually got, got out in the media before the researcher actually had a chance to specifically give the statistical significance, which wasn't even there. Do you want to talk just a little bit about why sure. it came out in the media and then why things aren't as they seemed from that year? Well, I'd like to dive into what you suggested there, that the original report of a study committee of studying hormones in women, it did not say that there was increased risk. Mm -hmm. 
what the press grabbed a hold of was a, a twerk of a, a, mis- a misunderstanding. For example, women on Premarin, horse urine derived estrogen, had a lessened risk by 21% less of a risk for developing breast cancer than women who were not on Premarin in, in menopause. And it, the issue was around this molecule called Prempro. It was a combination of Premarin with MP, medroxyprogesterone acetate, a progestin, a very different molecule than progesterone. And even in the original study, it said that there was a 1.26 increased relative risk, and it's followed by the words, which was not statistically significant. So in medicine and science, every scientist on the planet knows when you see there's no statistical significance, you don't want to place any, uh, you don't want to draw any conclusions. Well, this original study committee went on to follow these women and in 2016 published a follow-up in the Journal of American Medical Association, the original study committee, that after 18 years of follow-up, I'm pretty much quoting them, there is no increased risk of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. That has, they rescinded that original statement that poisoned the minds of the world. And, but hardly any physicians or women have heard about this recanting. Yes. Of, uh, so, yeah. Well, good. And that's why I'm so excited about having people like you because women need to hear this and need to feel safe because a lot of, I have women who are, you know, coming to the office and they've been terrified by their primary doctor or their gynecologist. Yes. Um, so let's talk about a specific, like, say we have 35, 40 year old woman who is in perimenopause. They're actually still cycling, but they're starting to be like that woman who came and put her fist on your desk and said, I don't feel like myself. I'm moody. I have, uh, you know, maybe breast tenderness or kind of symptoms. Do you want to take us through like what you might do with a 35, 40 year old woman versus maybe a 55 year old who stopped having cycles? And when you would like talk us through if someone would come in in those different ages and how you would treat them or, or test them? Sure. For one thing, a man and woman's hormones, we peak at the age of 20, Mm -hmm. plus or minus two years, and then we decline, men and women. And these are the most powerful biochemicals in our body. So the loss of them has widespread effects on the brain, on sleep, on mood, on sexual performance, on skin. The list is very long. And so 80% of the women, and you're naming the ages, They start feeling it. They start developing sleep issues. They're putting on weight that's surprising them. They're getting mood issues. They're getting dry vagina. A whole host. They're getting hot flashes even, but they're still menstruating. Mm -hmm. They're in decline. And one of the maxims is you can learn so much by the woman's story. As a physician, this is what we're trained in. (laughs) Listen to the people and come up with some ideas. And in 100% of these women who are open to it, and we have a magic line just to back up a little bit. We proactively speak to every woman about the risk because I've never sat in front of a woman that didn't have on the back of her mind or willing to say it out loud. If I take hormones, I'm at risk. So we go through what I just did with each as part of our initial process. And then we start these women on hormones. And we don't test them. Mm-hmm. If they're still having periods, the perimenopause is so erratic in hormone levels that if a woman's having hot flashes and waking up in the middle of the night, yet you test her on a day when her pituitary gland is trying to waken up those ovaries and bring them back to youth and pushing out a big stimulus, you can get a high hormone reading. And I, how did I learn this? I did a 24-hour urine hormone test on a woman who was still menstruating she was having hot flashes at night, vaginal dryness, uh, and a list of symptoms that are the absolutes yeah. for low hormones. And she looks at my test report and it says high in all the hormones because they are so erratic that if you test on the wrong day, you're going to baffle the clinician. So we, we our, our, our teaching is don't ever test a woman for hormone levels in the perimenopause. We test 100% of our women at the right time. Yes. So we start... Because women are so individual and men are so individual, we've developed a process that I learned from, I'm standing on the shoulders of some giants here, um, our forebearers, that I learned that you can titrate dosages. You can start with low dosages and we know what hormones they're missing. Mm -hmm. We can tell just by the history Mm -hmm. in 80% of the women. 
And we start with low doses of estrogen. We prefer biased. In fact, we are passionate about biased. Progesterone and testosterone and DHEA. And we start on low dosages and we first titrate the biased and the progesterone. And what I mean by this, we gradually increase this dose. We don't rapidly increase the dose. It's taken 20 years for these hormone levels to decline and all the receptor sites adjustment. I'm throwing in a little bit of a technical quirk there. So we awaken them gradually at a proper pace. And what happens to the woman? If we're right, and 99% of the time we are correct, because it is not rocket surgery here, they're going to reach a point where they're starting to get alleviation of the symptoms. And then there's this magical day when they say to us, and you started with perimenopause, we don't test them. But in a woman in menopause, the process is similar. She's just stopped menstruating. That means her ovaries aren't putting anything out. So there is no erratic underplay there. Uh, And when the woman in menopause says, oh, my God, I feel myself again. Thank you so much. I'm waiting for the the happiness. Yes. We test 100% of these women with 24-hour urine hormone testing, which is a subject unto itself, because it turns out that even if a woman titrates to symptom alleviation, 50% of those women are not on enough estrogen to protect their vagina and bones. Yes. And 25% are on more robust doses of estrogen, which put them at risk for breast glandular cell proliferation. We don't want new breast cells that occur every month in a young woman. We don't want to see the mitosis. Best case scenario, there are exceptions in a a, a 50-year-old woman. Process is the same. We got symptoms. We start low, gradually increase the dosage. The woman starts feeling better. (laughs) Same with men. This, the process is the same for men. You got a midlife man who's got erectile issues and he is low in testosterone. Yes. And you gradually replenish it in a proper way and, and test the very moving parts. And he, his erection returns and his life changes. Yeah. No, both, like you said, both men and women. And sadly, with a whole other topic, but our environmental toxic load and all of this burden on our immune system and stress and physiology, I'm seeing this more acutely uh, at younger ages too, for both men and women. I mean, now it's not uncommon for me to see a 30 or 35 year old man with a testosterone of 300 or 250, you know, these crazy low levels. Now, usually there's other things like infection, toxic load, other things that are going on, but it's very real and very present. And it's part of our environmental load. So I love that you explained that. And I also wanted to just uh, laughingly share, I always talk to uh, the perimenopausal women who are still cycling. I'm like, your hormones are like the last bit of ketchup out of the tube where you're on, you know, there's like this spurting of ketchup and they laugh and like, yeah, because, you know, they know that whole up and down. And I love that you said that too, because yeah. there's no sense in testing when you're getting those spurts and you don't know which spurt you're catching, um, but it's important to treat. You typically like say someone who is cycling and just starting to have sleep issues and mood issues and maybe cyclically driven, do you typically start with just progesterone in those women until they have the estrogen deficiency symptoms? Not, well, it's, you know, once again, as you know so well, it's such an individual story. And uh, women are going to tell you the story of what hormones are low. And like you were saying, oh, my God, 25-year-olds who are having anxiety that they never had before. And uh, they don't relate to the word anxiety, but now they know what it is. Right. And they've got irregular cycles. Yeah. These young women are just in great shape for progesterone because progesterone is a great calmer. And so much good could be done on this planet by starting off with progesterone alone in the youngest of women. And why? Gosh, you mentioned the elephant in the room. People have a, I find people often have a tough time grasping how pervasive these, these poisons that are in our food supply and in the air and in the water bottles we're drinking, how profound effect they have. And one of the things they've done is they've lowered, they, they act like estrogens, for example. Yes. yes. And the average age of the onset of menopause, of, um, of having a period mm-hmm. happens to be five years early, earlier than it was when I was growing up. Yes. So these, these toxins are really a big deal. And I just didn't want to pass on, but other than emphasizing what you're saying there, and it, it's, a, it's a real call to become an expert in cleaning up your own life <laughs> and doing and reducing your toxic exposure the best as you possibly can, because they are. 
very impactful. And then um, we, by the time women show up to my office, it's most common that their their whole hormonal system, especially progesterone, that's the first to go, and it's usually the deepest. It can fall earlier and deeper than the estrogen decline. Yes. So there's often an imbalance. If a young woman is having breast tenderness, but she didn't have it five years ago, well, you want to lead with progesterone. But very often, these young women are also low in their estrogen. So we do independent variables, and they're going to tell us about the low estrogen. Mm -hmm. They're going to give us symptoms. So we start progesterone and estrogen at the same time, and we titrate them at different rates. And we really want to maximize that progesterone. There's so much relief yeah. that can occur from progesterone. But we also, by the time they show up in my office, they're often low in estrogen. And, yes. you know, different than when I started out in practice, when there was a lot of women who went into the perimenopause with increased androgens, it's a way for their body to, to make up for the loss of estrogens. So it used to be common that we'd be cautious around perimenopause and administering testosterone. These are long, these are days long ago. Yeah. I'd say 85% of the women who are 45 and still menstruating are also have, have exhausted, so to speak, their androgens as well. And they're giving low androgen symptoms. Yeah. So it's, it's, you can really hear it from them. So quite often we'll first titrate the progesterone and the estrogen. Yes. And give a small dose and steady dose of the testosterone and DHEA. And then when we've really alleviated the, these two variables, the symptoms derived from it, we're going to start titrating that testosterone. And then the 24-hour urine hormone test is going to tell us when they're in the good zone. Not too much and not too little. No, I couldn't agree more. I really like that you specified that because that's exactly, I always like to do the estrogen progesterone first with a much lower dose and then later um, do the other two. Uh, so a couple of things, first of all, for those listening, you and I could uh, in our sleep uh, spout off the symptoms of progesterone deficiency, estrogen deficiency. Do you want to give just a tiny bit of an overview for those listening so they might know where they lie and what would be typical different hormones show for symptoms for a woman? Sure. Um, progesterone is the great calmer. That's a very unusual biochemical and biologic process. Most of these hormones, including the ovarian hormones, are activating. They're stimulating. They can energize. And for example, there's a lot of young women athletes that are not menstruating anymore because their bodies are recruiting estrogen and testosterone for the fight or flight that they're, they're doing through their rigorous training programs. Progesterone is different. Mm -hmm. It's the great calmer. If we were to inject the proper dose intravenous of progesterone, we're not doing this, but yeah. you know, just as an example, uh, we don't have to give progesterone intravenous <laughs> ever. Oh, yes, we do. There are some exceptions in trauma. Right. But if we give the right dose to you or to me, we could be put to a sleep so deep, surgery could be performed on us. I'm saying this because think calm. So a young woman who feels emotionally relatively balanced, I mean, there is human life and there is the challenges of human life and we have some emotional ups and downs. But if a, woman, a young woman tells me she's getting anxious, even though she's regularly menstruating, she needs the great calmer. She needs the progesterone to calm her down and help her. And it's, it's, sometimes it's magical that she used to consider herself having anxiety and getting a diagnosis of anxiety. And then she's calm again. So that's one, that's the main one. But progesterone also calms for sleep. Mm -hmm. So when women are having a sleep disturbance, for example, they're having trouble falling asleep, that's a big one for progesterone too. Calm. So you restore progesterone and you can contribute to the sleep disturbances. But estrogen has some different qualities. Like the fall of estrogen in a woman's body to lower levels than what she likes is stressful. And she can, she's going to trigger the biology of fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And it, the biology of fight or flight is led by adrenaline. And she's going to get adrenaline in the middle of the night and wake up and not go back to sleep because her midlife liver doesn't uh, process the adrenaline at the same rate as her 20-year-old liver did. So she gets to stay awake with a very, very active mind. That's a different type of sleep disturbance. So they can even wake up with a hot flash. Yeah. So these often come so close mm -hmm. together 
that we're working the estrogen deficiency along with the progesterone by the time a woman shows up in the office. The exception for me is the young woman um, who has adequate estrogen often, but the progesterone is dropped off because she's not ovulating. In order to produce the robust amount of progesterone that a young woman produces each cycle, she must ovulate. If she doesn't, she's got a very low amount. So anxiety in a young woman, progesterone. Yes, couldn't agree more. And typically, are you because of the effect of the pre, the post cursors of GABA with progesterone? Are you using oral progesterone in young women, or both transdermal and oral? Do you have a preference? Well, we grew up with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you you want to start with oral, if a woman's having sleep disturbance and the very effect that you were talking about, technically, but we've been able to. Uh, through their organic oils, administer rather robust dosages of topical progesterone. Amazing. Uh, you know, the other hormones, estrogen, we do not want to give estrogen by mouth. Agreed. Yes. And I'm not going to go into the list of trouble that can occur. And we don't want to give testosterone by mouth. We want to give it topically. And there's reasons for that. But progesterone is different. Progesterone is safe to give orally. And uh, we love to start with the topical because when you give something orally, about 10 to 20% of it actually makes it by the liver into your body. So what happens to that 80%? Well, it becomes metabolites. Well, the data, there, there's so much safety around oral progesterone that we would never accuse the principal metabolite, the 80% or 90% that gets produced and the body never sees. We'd never accuse it of being problematic, but we'd rather copy nature. We'd rather not overload a liver. So we're 100% of the time starting with topical. And if we can't achieve the levels or results we want with topical, we'll switch women to oral to the extent that half the women in my practice are on oral, half are on topical. Oh, love it. Um, so in your, you've been doing this a while and it's so profound to see because you were really a leader in this, but in your last 20, 30 years, what do you wish you could have told yourself 30 years ago about what you know now as it relates to hormones and integrative approaches to medicine? Well, let's, let's see. I think some of the major principles that matter so much to women is that ultimately we're dealing with prescriptive items. So I say to most women, there's a job. You got a job. And the job is to seek out a licensed healthcare provider that really knows what they're doing. They've gotten training beyond what we learned in medical school, which we didn't learn any of this right. stuff. Right. And they, but they've gone out and they reached into the courses and the, the treating the teaching that's really abundant these days. So your job to every woman is find a provider that you feel good with. That just like Joe was saying, you want to sit in the presence of that provider and go, wow. Oh. Yeah. This is the person for me. You go shopping, really, yes. and you find that provider. That's the one main recommendation I have to women. Now, there's so many women that are scientifically oriented that they want to know more and learn more. And there's a lot of resources for that. And I have a lot of fun with this scientifically because it's a real uh, interesting synergistic yeah. uh, situation with them. And you can, but that's not your main job. Your job is to get a prescriber that is, you really feel comfortable with. And to get down to the mechanics of that, for one thing with telemedicine, menopause medicine, andropause medicine, lends itself beautiful to tele telemedicine. We do not have to see a, a patient in person. Yeah. Do I like seeing patients in person? Yeah. What you described, Jill, in, in the movie, it, it, this is a big deal. It can really, but you know, it also works to do telemedicine with this work. And so you, you've got access to providers who are licensed in your state. So you've got a much bigger, um, uh, and one way, how do you find these providers? Well, one thing you can do, there's 7,500 compounding pharmacists in the United States. And what I suggest is you walk into your local one, mm -hmm. not on the phone. Yeah. They're busy people. Walk into the pharmacy. They like people. Yes. <laughs> So there's a high likelihood they're going to walk back from their their uh, compounding room and talk to you because they like it. And you ask them this. 
you're you're receiving a lot of prescriptions, and I I have a need for hormones, and I really would like to go to someone that you really feel confident in. Who in our community can you give me a list of three that you really like because they're seeing the quality of prescriptions and they're able to identify who really knows what they're doing and who doesn't. So you could do that for your community, or you could go online. Uh, to our our organization because we have we train providers all over the United States, but that's the main thing for women that I think matter. Find someone you really like because you're on a long journey. Yeah. Just ask me as a man, when will I stop taking my testosterone? When I can't get the cap off. <laughs> <laughs> same same oh, with oh. me for hormones. <laughs> Well, I love that. I love the suggestion to go to the company pharmacy because we have a very special relationship, you and I, any of us who are in this realm with our company pharmacies, because we can't do what we do without the experts that help make this possible to create formulations that really work. So I love that you said that. So you are teaching and your real effort now is to really teach the, I always say, I like to teach the teachers and influence the influencers and you're doing the same thing. So tell us about uh, where can people find you? Where can they find the courses? What are you up to now? Just share a little bit about where we can find your work. Well, you can go to DRR at IOBIM.com or go to IOBIM, Institute of Bioidentical Medicine is what it stands for. IOBIM, IOBIM.com, and you'll encounter a lot of information and a lot of different avenues and pathways, and also a, connect, a connector to, because we've trained so many that very often we have a provider that's working out of your state that you could connect with. And I love the providers that go through our training. It's, it's, there's a lot to it. It's rigorous, and we follow, we mentor them also. We do grand rounds every week. And we are there. We're there. Our medical team is there to answer their immediate questions when they're in a tough case and they can't figure out the next step. So uh, I, I know every single one of these providers we train, and they're, they're a good group. They're the functional medicine group, right? Yeah, yeah. I love right, that. Jill? This, yeah, we this, just this is a be. good group of doctors and nurses, nurse practitioners. Yeah, so we will be sure wherever you're listening, if you're driving, don't stop the car. You can find this in the show notes wherever you're listening. I will be sure and put the links to your websites, to your programs. Um, Dr. Rosesweet, is, as always, this time goes so quickly, and it has been an absolute joy to get to know you better and to hear your heart in medicine and helping women and men through this transition. And I really love that you've been at this for such a long time. You're really at the forefront of the, the next generation. And I think you and I both want to change the face of medicine in a positive way. So I get so excited about aligning with people like you. So thank you again for coming on the show. It has been so much fun. Thank you, Jill. It's such an honor. Yeah, such an honor to absolutely. Be with you. I, I know who you, I know who you are Aww. and I know what you've been doing. And I've been very touched by your by your whole life and story and your your brilliance as a professional. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. That deeply touches me as well. And if you're out there listening, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Resiliency Radio. As you know, you can find all the transcripts, all the links and uh, past episodes at jillcarnahan.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Dr. Rosensweet, thank you again from the bottom of my heart for the work that you're doing. And I hope to see you soon in real person. <laughs>